We're recording. Alright. Very nice. Cerebral Zone, episode six. <laughs> With Brett Bannon, right? Did I yeah. pronounce it right? You did. Alright. Zach Gomez, me. Um, but yeah, how you doing, Brett? I'm doing good. It's a good day. It's hot. It's hot. <laughs> yeah. So, just curious. I got a pretty extensive list of questions I want to ask. All right. But uh, yeah, I mean, to get us started, um, I don't think we've talked about Activo yet. Okay. How did Activo come about and what is it? So yeah, Activo, that it was uh, an automation company that I started on my own, um, just like a single one-man shop. And that was actually my first venture post corporate world. So Activo was what I actually set up, you know, right as I left my old job, again, looking for a big company. Um, and so not much different than Loomis, but you know, Loomis kind of came shortly after um, partnering with Eduardo, and he had his own um, integration company, and I had my own. And then Loomis is really the joint uh, venture that we went in together, and, and now it's what we're growing and it's, it's getting bigger. Thanks. What was Eduardo's company called? That one was Alpha Engineering. Alpha Controls? Alpha Controls and, and Engineering, engineering something like that? Yeah, that okay. sounds right. Yep. So when Activo started, um, well, beforehand, you said that you were programming on your own. Mm -hmm. um, what type of programming languages were you using? And maybe if we can, like a description of like what you were doing for the customers. Yeah, so really the main two languages used in the industrial world are ladder logic, you'll hear that one all the time. And then one that's probably used just as common but mentioned less is structured text. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the two main languages. Uh, there's pros and cons of both. I mean, ladder logic's like graphical based, um, where structured text is. You know, when you think of coding, you see a bunch of text on the screen, and that's that's how that one is structured. Like Python, C plus plus. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, so right. I mean, I I was um, you know, working for a big company who sold hardware projects and and really our, our job at the company was to help the customer um, you know guide them on their project that they're trying to complete um, but at the end of the day the goal is to sell the hardware to them um, not the software and not the integration work so all the time you know customers would they be trying to execute a project um, you know they're talking to my past company um, sales team, customer service, and engineering team that I was on, and you know, we're helping them not necessarily design the project from scratch, but helping them fine-tune it and select parts to use on the project. Um, but then the customer would say, okay, this is great, now how do I put it together, who programs it, and our old company would be basically saying, you know, sorry, we don't do that. Um, sometimes you know, we, there were outside people that we might recommend, but it was pretty rare. And so a lot of times the customer was, I don't wanna say out of luck, but they they got so far in the project, they had it designed mechanically, they had the components selected, but then no one to do the software or, or integrate everything all together. So, you know, it was almost a win-win doing software in the evenings because our customers wouldn't move forward with us on the hardware side knowing that there was no solution for the software side. Right. And so, um, you know, certainly um, didn't want to mix the two and, you know, our, our marching orders were sell the hardware, don't get involved in the software. So I kind of stayed away from that stuff during the nine to five hours. But then after, after hours and on weekends when customers needed it, I, I was involved in the software side. That sounds incredible. <laughs> Being able to do both and then take on another opportunity outside from nine to five. Um, I guess 
I could say, how did you end up uh, developing your skill set enough to feel comfortable working for somebody programming? Yeah, it's it's definitely not easy, and, and you got to push yourself outside of your comfort zone. Um, I did that a bunch, and I've definitely put myself in situations that you know I'm like, wow, I'm over in over my head here. What's going on? Um, and so I just kind of threw myself into the deep end now, not just not just blindly, but certainly took on stuff that, you know, in my head I'm like, okay, I think I can make this work. I think this is how it should go, but not with a completely clear picture in my head of the solution path. And then, you know, I take on the work and then figure out the solution along the way. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's not, if you're trying to live a stress field, free life, that's certainly not the path to go, because <laughs> so many times, whether it's awake, you know, trying to figure out solutions and do research online and, mm -hmm. and things like that, um, you know, whether you're awake and actively doing that or you're just lying in bed and you're like staring at the ceiling and you can't sleep and you're like, man, I got to find a solution to this thing by tomorrow. I don't see the, the solution in sight. Something's got to happen. And then you're just like... Yeah, you're just like either trial and error or trying to talk to vendors to help, you know, have them help you. But mm -hmm. it um, it was very stressful to say the least. <laughs> and currently in your position, do you think that stress is continued, or you're in a better position right now in terms of stress? Uh, no, it's continued. Oh, all right. I it's almost become I don't want to say uh, to say that I'm comfortable with it. I guess is a good way to say it. I'm like comfortable with stress, mm -hmm. um, and maybe we can get into you know stuff later to help you know talk about you know things to manage that. Mm -hmm. um, but um, you know also just knowing, I guess there's confident there's being confident in yourself that you can find a solution, and then there's the um, you know just putting yourself in stressful situations and not not stopping your own growth because you don't want to be stressed out. Right, right. Yeah, that does give me a lot to think about. Yeah, and hopefully like, the viewers too. <laughs> yeah, it's like growth comes from stress. It's like even it like, like like you know, working out and building muscles, you've got to put put your muscles through some strain and stress for them to grow. And so right. whether it's your brain or your career or you know your social endeavors, whatever they are, I would say you know if you want if you intend on growing, then you got to put yourself in stressful situations. It's deep. <laughs> Some sauce here on the podcast from Brett. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, so stress, the topic mm -hmm. now. Yep. Um, and you only put you only put yourself forward to these situations, and you knew that you were gonna get something out of this. Yeah. So I mean, I think my interest in entrepreneurship actually started from an interest just in self growth. Mm -hmm. um, I really loved like the topics of like dieting and brain health um, over on. The from a bookshelf in the other room, I got probably 12 books or so, like on the brain and you know, how it works and how to keep it healthy. Mm -hmm. um, so that was like my passion at first. Was like, okay, how does the brain work? Like, this is a crazy thing that we have. Um, and so I started learning about that, and then that turned into podcasts of self growth, and then the self growth podcasts were having these guests that were entrepreneurs all the time. And they were like, this is what I had to do to start my path. You know, my path can be different from your path, but um, think about these things. And so then it was almost like a, like an afterthought. Of, like, you know, I'm, from age 15, I, I didn't necessarily want to start my own company. Like that wasn't the goal from age 15. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of developed over time. And then when you work so long in the corporate world, you kind of can see the structure and how things work. and and what's beneficial and what's holding people back. And so you kind of have that template in your head and you're, you're listening on the side to all these entrepreneurs saying, here are the things to pay attention to, here are the things to work on. 
don't go down these mistakes, you know, look at this stuff. So mm -hmm. it was just like a perfect storm of self-development, uh, you know, brain health, uh, and guidance from from these people that I listened to and read about mm -hmm. that really made me go, okay, I think I think this is the next step in like life in, in, my, in my career is like starting my own company. Yeah. And it just was kind of like a, a, a side, eh, not a side thought, but certainly wasn't the main focus for um, five to ten years. It's probably like a two-year planning period before I actually did it. Right. Do you think um, the people on the podcast, do you, would you say that they they were your mentors? Absolutely. Like, yeah, absolutely indirectly. Um, yeah, definitely. Invaluable knowledge and um, mentors are such a big thing in life. Do you have mentors personally, like in person? Um, I mean, I, I have had different mentors over the years for, for certain. I mean, mm -hmm. um, various managers, uh, coaches. Um, I played a lot of sports growing up. Um, we'll get back to that later, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, for certain coaches, managers, um, my parents, you know, my dad, um, one of the luckiest people in the world. I have like two parents that are, are amazing, um, which goes very far. And it's, it's people who have great parents in their lives don't take that for granted because that's like the foundation of everything. We, we can go more yeah we can go more in depth in mentors okay because because uh i mean me personally here at Lumis, is, i got you Eduardo, joe i'm sure a couple other people mm -hmm. will also show up later yeah and um and going back to like the topic of like self-growth mm -hmm. and, and things like that mentors are so so important in that process and so if you know, if you don't have like a set mentor, I would say whatever you're chasing or whatever the next steps in life are for you, try and find out someone, and they don't need to be like a famous person or like a, a professor or, you know, this expert in some topic, but even just someone who's like two or three years like further down the path than you, and even if they're super successful or not, you know, just see if you can spend a little bit of time with them and pick their brain. Like it could be, um, oh, I'm trying to think. Like if, if um, I don't know, if you really love uh, math or, um, I mean, even entrepreneurship. You know, we talk about, you know, talk about that a lot on this yeah. podcast. Mm -hmm. um, you know, don't you don't need to like reach out to like Mark Cuban or Bill Gates or like Warren Buffett. Like Titans, yeah, like, dogs. <laughs> yeah, like just find someone who is you know, fairly accessible, and you know, it could be even just like a simple email or you know, their phone number on the website or something. Um, you know, just reach out, and if, if they don't need to be the super successful person, you know, even if they've only been doing it for two or three years, mm -hmm. um, just ask them a few questions on how they got there and what are some of the mistakes they made or what are some of the things that you know you should be looking out for and they without a doubt can at least provide some guidance you know, even if they even if they fail to be honest sharing those you know, stories are invaluable so that you don't make the same mistakes yeah those are that's really really important uh thing to keep asking people um like, I know we haven't gotten to the question yet, but hopefully, you know, maybe you would be willing to share some of your failures? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, you know, what's something you'd be willing to share about your journey through, like, a Tivo and Loomis? Um, yeah, so, I mean, there's a, there's a few different directions it could go. Um, I think... Overall, I think we've done a pretty good job at mitigating risk. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Eduardo and I have worked together a long time, and I always say that, you know, we're like the yin and yang of each other. Because, yeah, because he, you know, we, 
We're very, very similar, but we do have opposite personalities in a lot of situations. I have, I have noticed that Eduardo tends tends to be a lot more extroverted. I think you like to be a lot in your head a lot, mm -hmm. which is good. I think uh, you guys do work very well with each other. Yeah, I mean, he's just like go, 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 like keep it moving forward, which is great for someone like me who does like overthink in a lot of situations and um, that's something I've had to work on uh, a lot over the years is don't you know paralyze myself with decision making or over analyzing um, you know, if any entrepreneur out there you know you, you need to move forward without knowing all the, the steps ahead of time like one step at a time and so I think I think Igor and I work great together because he pushes the envelope forward and I and like fine tune those details and like make sure that we're doing it the right way, be cautious, you know, mm -hmm. let's not move so fast, but yes, let's move forward. Right. So I think that's like, we work very well together in a sense. Yeah. I, mean, I didn't think about, about it like that till now, but I can see it pretty clearly. I mean, Adora mentioned something, let's do it. And then I'll see a book on your desk. You'll be reading up on it picking out the details and working it out. Mm -hmm. no. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, paralyzing ourselves. With yeah, that, that small bit of advice of paralyzing, paralyzing yourselves and overthinking. Um, that's something that I <laughs> struggle with quite often. Um, you know, thinking in my head, making sure I want all these conditions to be perfect, finding out, attempt the next step. How have you overcome this, uh, I don't want to say it's a problem because I think it's very useful mm -hmm. in some cases. Mm -hmm. But um, how have you gone and pushed the envelope? Is it Eduardo helping you? Have you read books, probably? Yeah. Um, again, like books and podcasts, like I'm, I'm always reading or listening to something. I drive a lot nowadays, so mm -hmm. um, audiobooks are, are kind of my thing right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, seeing, seeing other people make decisions quickly and, you know, you're thinking, okay, well, here's the worst case scenario, here's the middle case, the best case, and da da da, da. and very rarely is it ever the worst case and very rarely is it ever the best case. So mm -hmm. seeing it in practicality is one thing that kind of helps, you know, ease, ease my mind or helps me over the years. Um, but then also just practicing it myself with very small things like um, if my girlfriend can't ever decide where she wants to eat in terms of like a restaurant <laughs> and so like you know I'll prepare like two or three options and usually like ask her hey if one of these work and if she still can't decide I mean I just pick one and like just know that it's not going to be bad it's not going to be amazing I mean it's it's we're picking dinner for the night we're not even going to remember what we ate two weeks from now right so like just practicing like that we're like okay italian or or um whatever chinese okay italian boom that's what it is don't even think about it twice just let's get our shoes on let's head out the door and just like just do that because you'll find something there exactly mm -hmm. so just little things like that um or like choosing what you want to eat on the menu like don't overthink it, pick something, and you're not going to remember the decision again a week or two from now. Yeah, that's a really good way to put it because I think I struggle with this option that is in front of me, this book on the road. I think it, I think uh, it's greater than what it probably is. Like, man, how is this going to affect my life later? And it gets super in depth into it. But, yeah. you know, I like that analogy, or at least that thing you do with your fingers is like a it's never really going to be the worst case. It's never really going to be the best case either. It's just some, somewhere in the middle, you'll find it. Right? Yeah. yeah. And um, I mean, I've seen you working around the office and um, business decisions. Mm -hmm. You use that method with that as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of the projects that we got recently, how did you feel? Um, I guess I could say, how, do you still believe me with business decisions 
you still feel comfortable um, taking them? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that comes from a few different places. Obviously, business decisions could have a bigger impact on your life than where you want to eat dinner tonight. Right. Um, but at the same time, it is important to just keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, I still think about the worst case scenarios. They certainly come in my head. Um, but you got to do what you got to do to mitigate the risk. And, to, and you know, projects have a ton of variables in them. You know, like who's the customer, what's the project, um, what's the timeline, and what's the budget. So many things come into play. Um, but, you know, over time, I've gotten better and better at kind of picking out, you know, okay, this project seems risky versus this one doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's just the product of going through it. Um, I've certainly taken on projects in the beginning of my career that, you know, were super difficult and I didn't quote the right number, but I just had to get the project done, whether you take it at a loss or, um, I mean, fortunately, in the very beginning, I was doing mostly software stuff, mm -hmm. not hardware related, so the cost was just my time. Um, but then that's where, you know, you're like staying up all night just working on these projects that you thought would take a week and they take, you know, four weeks worth of time. Mm -hmm. So you're just like pulling all-nighters or working weekends to like get this stuff done. Yeah, I, I noticed how hard you were working when I met you. Was it early 2020? Mm -hmm. I mean, how long did Activo exist before I, I met you? Activo, let's see, I want to say that one was started in 2018. Mm -hmm. So two, two, three years into it, and I know I was there, you guys were still working like seven days. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so it is, uh, it does sound like a lot of work going out and doing your own thing, but you, know, you seem to, like you mentioned other uh, the other podcasts, that you seem to have a lot of satisfaction, self-satisfaction with it, being on your own, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the work that I love doing that makes it bearable. Okay. Um, yeah, I work a ton. Yes, I'm in lots of stressful situations, but probably my biggest passion in life is solving complex problems mm -hmm. and I have directed that at industrial automation and so you know with the background in mechanical engineering lots of experience with code and software mm -hmm. um, those are like my tools to solving these complex problems so you know the excitement and the joy and the drive and the passion comes from a place of loving loving the work and loving what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And so that makes the stress bearable and the long hours bearable. Because mm -hmm. um, if you don't if you don't like what you're doing, you're gonna you're gonna give up and it's and it's not worth it, quite frankly. Like definitely don't get into business only for money, you know, overlooking the means of getting in. Right. Because the means are what make it all work out and make it bearable. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's really good advice. I think you highlight like that. <laughs> Put in subtitles. Um, but yeah, I mean, I like to trace back a little bit um, on self improvement. Mm -hmm. And maybe already have the brain. So, um, so the books that you read, what specifically were you looking out on topics mm -hmm. of the brain that probably have become healthier or um, how to maximize your main tool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, um, I think it stemmed from like, uh, almost like, yeah, questioning things like memory, like, hey, I want to improve my memory. How does memory work? And so I started reading a book on memory and tools to improve your memory. Um, and, and then it gets into like neuroplasticity and how the brain can change over time. And, you know, 10, 20 years ago, we thought that the brain was just like 
of concrete, like you're born with a good brain or a bad brain and you can't change it. But now we know that that's not the case. Um, and so, yeah, those, those kind of topics and then dieting and, and eating right were another, another like topic that I would love to read and, and listen to podcasts about. And then come to find out they're like directly correlated. The food you eat impacts your brain so much. Mm-hmm. Um, and a perfect analogy is a car in the fuel that you put in it. Um, yeah. And so you put you know, crappy fuel in a Ferrari, the Ferrari's still gonna perform poorly. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, the right vitamins and minerals and, and, and uh, what you eat really influence your brain, your mood, your ability to retain um, you know, memory of things. Mm-hmm. Just your decision-making process, like your prefrontal cortex that makes all the important decisions. Like, if you're not eating a healthy diet, you're not gonna be thinking clearly. You're gonna have mood swings, and that's gonna influence relationships around you and, and a whole bunch of other things. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I, I can't stress enough how important it is to think about your brain and your brain health. And dieting is a huge one. Sleep is another big one. Sleep is huge. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't realize how important sleep is, right? Mm-hmm. I think uh, was it the big three big ones? It's sleep, diet, exercise. Yeah. Um, I remember when I borrowed that book from you, and I know I was kind of getting into it. And I I think that definitely kickstarted um, that journey for me um, in terms of like trying to keep myself healthy. Mm-hmm. So I was just started to get into the gym and trying to fix up my diet and then you loaned me the book and you know it showed me all the different types of food the vitamins what they do for you you know that helped a lot so definitely uh, a good part of the good mental <laughs> yeah yeah the book genius foods right yeah yeah um, really good man. it's been a while but you know i asked we were on the topic about the brain a couple years ago i think it was 2020 right yeah and, you know, I I didn't get all the way through the book, but I think I learned enough um, on just being aware mm-hmm. of what food does yeah. for you. I mean, even now recently, like uh, change, trying to change things up with what we eat here for lunch, or um, you know, trying to keep it healthy. Um, but let's see, going back to sleep, uh, what are some of the things that you can probably tell us? Yeah, that that one, I say, isn't this at least to me isn't as complex as dieting. Um, you know, they say we all need what well, I guess the the stereotype used to be at least eight hours of sleep, mm-hmm. um, and that I don't think is the case necessarily anymore. Really? Yeah, I mean, certainly that that's could be a good baseline number, but I think now we. You know, research shows that we have these circadian rhythms that um, mm-hmm. are about an hour and a half long each each sleep cycle. Okay. I guess the circadian rhythms are related to like when you go to sleep and wake up, and I think it's kind of like based around the sun and the time of day that you do that. Mm-hmm. Um, keeping those in a steady pattern are definitely beneficial. Like the body and the brain love patterns and like repeatable patterns. Yeah. Um, so finding a schedule where you can go to sleep and wake up at the same time you know consistently mm-hmm. is important um unfortunately that's not always possible i get it you know we all have crazy lives and, um and I have, even for myself sometimes it's difficult to stay on a consistent schedule uh, but then finding um finding out you know an hour and a half um, cycle in your sleep so i think you know I forget what the name of the book was, but they were talking about how actually seven and a half hours of sleep will feel better than eight hours. Seven and a half hours of sleep will right. feel better? Right, because that falls, that would be about five hour and a half long cycles. And I'm mm-hmm. drawing a blank on the name, I should, I should look it up here. Um, so, because your body will be naturally sort of like, you know, you know, a waking up state right around seven and a half hours mm-hmm. where waiting another half hour will, you'll be like 
falling back into a deep sleep, mm -hmm. like a REM cycle almost. Right. And waking up in the middle of that, you'll feel groggy. You won't want to get up, so you won't, like, you'll be more tempted to press the snooze button, things like that. So <laughs> I've, I've, I found that helpful. And so, yeah, I typically lean for seven and a half, or if it's a late night, six, I lean for six hours. Mm -hmm. um, Minimum? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Try to eat yeah, for six. Yeah, for it. So, um, yeah, I mean, again, like we're all, we're all kind of victims of our schedule and when the schedule gets crazy, you kind of got to do what you got to do. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely, in college, I would pull all-nighters and, you know, I, I'll, I'll pull them every once in a while, but only when it's absolutely necessary. Right. Um, doing that too much, it definitely, you know, be hurtful to uh, your brain and yeah, short-term memory and, and long-term memory and mood and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I experienced like, sleep. Sleep for me, I'd like to get something seven or nine hours in between or blah blah. It doesn't really feel that great. Ten hours, like on the dot, you know, I have like Samsung watch and it tells me mm -hmm. my cycles and you know, something like you got seven hours in like four minutes, feeling great. Or, I mean, I don't know how, how many people see it. I don't think nine hours is oversleeping at all. I think. That's kind of pushing it though, a little bit. That's like a weekend thing, but uh, seven hours for me feel great. Nine hours, especially if I do a really heavy session of like boxing. Mm -hmm. That one uh, helped me out a lot. I know sleep is very important for muscle recovery. Yeah. But um, for me, in boxing, I think it's just a little bit more than muscle. I think it's like the whole nervous system. Yeah. Um, I like boxing, but I think like an average session would be considered overtraining in terms of like powerlifting and bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. over, I think it's over, overtraining for sure, but that's my ranges. I mean, do you think you can get away with less sleep than the average? Um, I think I can be comfortable with six hours, mm -hmm. um, but seven and a half feels really good. Mm -hmm. um, and, and sometimes it's not perfect. You know, if I, if I get six and a half or seven, you know, not exactly six or seven and a half, um, and I'll, uh, I'll shoot to try and get one or the other. Uh, but, you know, it's in the middle, kind of is what it is. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'll say it's pretty rare that I sleep more than, than eight or seven and a half, to be honest. Okay. Yeah, it's probably good. A range of what I hear on average from most people. You know, they gotta get up and they gotta go do things. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you can run on seven or seven and a half hours. I think that's like, I think it sounds average for people to feel good, to be honest. Um, I was reading, not reading, I was listening to another podcast saying that like eight hours might be pushing it, might be unnecessary. unnecessary. You're saying it's about the cycles. I think that's. Um, According to what you're reading, it sounds accurate. I mean, any, any, you know, too much or too less, uh, even if it's a decent amount of sleep, right? I don't know, this news button. I feel like it's very specific for each person. Yeah, probably for specific for each person. I can't say that <laughs> um, But with that, what do you think about caffeine in your health? Yeah, that's I mean, a big one. Yeah, I'm definitely a coffee drinker. You know, full disclosure. Um, <laughs> I love I love coffee, um, but I try to avoid it uh, probably after noon these days. Mm -hmm. um, I used to drink a lot more in the past, um, but those all matters. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> yep. um, so I used to drink a lot in the past, and in. I've noticed, I mean, it kind of has changed over time for me. Like, I used to be able to drink a coffee at 5 p.m. and be asleep by, you know, 11 or midnight. Mm -hmm. But that's not the case anymore for whatever reason. Um, you know, if I drink a coffee at 5 p.m., I'm probably up until like 1 or 2 mm -hmm. in the morning. The way your body metabolizes it is different now as you've gotten a bit older? Yeah, that could certainly be the case. Okay. I mean, I was listening to another podcast about and wrote a book 
I can't give the details, maybe I might put a picture mm -hmm. of the book of uh, the author. And he was saying that about the levels of caffeine from like a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. Caffeine. Um, you, take, you say take it around, I think it would be 1 30 or 2 p.m. About, I believe it was about a quarter of the caffeine from that coffee will be in your system by midnight still. Right. I think they have an eight hour, I think caffeine has an eight hour half life time mm -hmm. in your body. So, so yeah, so if you drink a cup of coffee that's 90 milligrams, you know, eight hours later, you're down to 45 milligrams so in your bloodstream. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, 16 hours later, you know, you're at whatever. Yeah, small amount. Yeah. That could still affect sleep. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Caffeine, phone screens, yeah. computer screens. I mean, alcohol or you know, drugs in general. Oh, yeah. Um, all of those can affect it. And, and just eating, too. Like, you know, down a bunch of ice cream and cookies before oh. bed, you're going to have a bunch of sugar in your body. And you might fall asleep, but I almost guarantee that that sleep won't feel as satisfying as, you know, even up. Yeah, I mean, I try to stay away from lots of caffeine throughout the day, you know, I, I was also hearing that it affects uh, blood flow, which is needed mm -hmm. for pretty much everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, you want to think, you want to exercise, you know, it's caffeine and exercise have been paired mm -hmm. together yeah. for a while, I mean, I frequent drinker of pre-workout for mm -hmm. exercise purposes not for cardio because that makes my heart feel weird. <laughs> yeah I mean for heavy lifting caffeine goes with it well but um, now that I hear that it restricts blood flow and I don't know if I think is caffeine not that great mm -hmm. for us yeah I mean I've seen a few studies on it at least I guess not caffeine specifically, but mm -hmm. coffee. Coffee. And you know, there's um, there's a, you know a little bit of um, or there's a few antioxidants in, in coffee. So they say like one cup a day, one to three cups a day. I want to say is is actually a little bit of a, a health benefit mm -hmm. um, in terms of like, anti-inflammatory and. Reducing your risk of getting types of cancer. Mm -hmm. um, I, I probably won't be more specific. I don't really share that as a disclaimer out there. But Brett, later, <laughs> if I meet the statistics, so I can put this in a podcast. Yeah. Because it's random for me. Yeah, it's something like one to two or one to three cups a day actually has health benefits, but then beyond three cups, now you're drastically increasing your risk for like dementia or oh. Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I'm sure many people would love the taste of coffee and, you know, build a massive resistance towards caffeine. Um, but, um, you know, what do you think about tea? Yeah, I think tea's good. Green tea, especially. I hear it's really good for you. Yeah. Low caffeine. Right, um, I want to say about a fifth of a cup of coffee. Really like, small. Yeah, 15 to 20 milligrams. Um, and tons of antioxidants. Mm -hmm. So a lot of good health benefits. My family, tea connoisseurs, they really? love their tea. Okay. Whether it's decaf or caffeinated, you know, they taste great. You know, I think you can have a little more fun with tea than you can with coffee. Mm -hmm. We're back. <laughs> nice. Um, so another one I want to, another question I want to uh, ask you about is, have you played any sports before? Yeah, I have. Um, so hockey was probably the biggest passion of mine mm -hmm. growing up. Um, and that's even aside from, from other things. Um, I just remember like wanting to play for like the Michigan Wolverines, like mm -hmm. college. Um, and then um, the Detroit Red Wings were like probably my favorite team growing up. And that's only a product of, you know, when you're like a tiny little kid playing in the sports, um, playing hockey um, they give you like a professional team and like I was on like the Red Wings. Oh, really? Like as a kid, like that, yeah, that's just like, there was the Red Wings, there was the Colorado Avalanche, like all the little teams in the league had mm -hmm. like a, 
they were just like like a smaller version named after them or yeah that was just like the the team name okay something to aspire to <laughs> yeah Sounds and cool. so and and i grew up in like in the 90s when colorado and detroit had like the best rivalry like oh man some of the games are crazy mm-hmm. um oh yeah sergey fedorov brendan shanahan chris chelios dominic hashik on the red wing side and then you got joe sackick peter forsberg um patrick wah on the avalanche side and those games were awesome so like playing hockey growing up it was a great time to watch hockey like the games were exciting um and so that was probably like yeah my biggest passion growing up was hockey itself um i played baseball played a little bit of soccer um and then it was just always like out in the yard playing with like the other kids in the neighborhood just like we would play stickball at my friend's house where we mm-hmm. literally would with chalk we would just draw a square on his his garage door and we would just throw a tennis ball e- at each other like as hard as we could Dang. and then we had like a broken broomstick and we legit would just be playing stickball in the yard like there'd be three of us and we would just rotate like a fielder a pitcher and a hitter mm-hmm. and i mean we were probably some of the the best kids at, on our baseball team at that time probably just because we were just out in the yard all day like throwing a tennis ball at us you know at each other with a broomstick jeez yeah um, always practicing <laughs> yeah yeah and it was just fun it's like it's like what you do during the summer mm-hmm. and just like shoot a basketball like whatever yeah yeah that sounds like a really fun childhood <laughs> <laughs> yeah i guess so how did you end up playing uh, or when did you end up playing hockey a little bit more seriously? Um, I mean, I think it, it was serious from a really young age. Mm-hmm. Um, I have two older brothers that both played competitively. Okay. And so um, we were talking about mentors earlier. Like I had them like guiding me like on things to do and what not to do and like little like secrets to like handle the puck or like how to defend guys coming at you. Mm-hmm. Um, and then growing up in upstate New York, we would all, you know, we'd build an ice rink in our backyard every winter. So, you know, you, you have hockey practice, you know, in the early evening, but then you come home and you have like floodlights in your backyard and then you just go play some more hockey when you get home. Yeah. Would you like invite like your friends over to compete with them like your backyard? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it wasn't huge. You couldn't fit like more than, you know, four or five people on, on the rink at once, but um, just having a net there and practicing one timers and shots and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. In high school or even in middle school, were you playing on a team? Yeah. Um, I mean, always playing travel, like with the travel league. Mm-hmm. Um, and then what's a travel league for people who don't know? <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's, it's like a, it's a league that or a team that's not affiliated with any school. Okay. Um, and then we would just be playing other teams. I mean, we were in upstate New York. We would, you know, teams in our our league would be, so we're from Rochester. You know, you're playing Buffalo. Teams from, like, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. um, like Boston. And then you're going to tournaments all the time up in Canada, like Whoa. Toronto, Quebec, mm-hmm. um, Ottawa. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, can you give us an example of, of- – what was it like playing high hockey like in general for for the unaffiliated team uh i mean no it was super fun i mean so many good memories um you know with the guys and and what doing whatever just getting into trouble like stupid 14 <laughs> year olds do um but it was really cool i mean in in you know it teaches you teamwork and being competitive and mm-hmm. training to win um i mean we were we were training from a very young age like mm-hmm. like lifting weights probably not like 12 and 13 but certainly certainly as soon as you hit freshman year in high school you're working out very yeah. frequently yeah about 13 14 yeah wow that's a good that's a good age to start yeah um you know in terms of hockey because i'm not very familiar with this with the sport um you know positions Mm -hmm. uh you played yeah yeah um so i started off as a defenseman um 
most of my career and then later on moved to forward um so yeah i kind of played both um you know defense and forward um yeah it just i i think i was a really good defenseman Mm -hmm. early on and i just stayed in that position and then actually an interesting story i broke my wrist and had to sit out eight weeks and um in an effort to like help get me back when i was first coming back off of that injury um i would be playing like on the penalty kill but as a forward so it was almost like a third defenseman Mm -hmm. out there um and then i guess i did really well with the puck and played really well as a forward and my coach kept me on and i I did fairly successful i mean Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. and you know i don't want to play into stereotypes but is it like always pretty brutal do you always get like uh tackled like they show in the movies <laughs> <laughs> uh, i guess it depends what movie you're watching uh-huh. <laughs> uh, like you're watching like the mighty ducks that that one gets pretty crazy uh, there's like scenes where the guy's got like a rodeo rope and he's like a lasso on a guy on the ice obviously that never happens but yeah i mean it was a pretty i guess brutal sport um I mean, I watch basketball and soccer nowadays, and guys are flopping and rolling on the ground when they didn't even get touched, and that's, that's right? just, like, embarrassing. Aww. Like, that's just – that's just – that's ridiculous. It's, it's just part of the sport. <laughs> that's – that's I, Don't tell I Eduardo. I, I know. Don't I know. T- <laughs> him, and I, him and I talk about it. Oh, yeah, when we watch soccer together. But, yeah, I mean, it is part of the sport. And, um, and – you know, again, back in the past, like in the '90s, no one really cared about their health. <laughs> like there oh, weren't, no. there weren't like getting con- getting a concussion, like mm-hmm. wasn't as serious back then as it is now. And I mean, obviously, studies come out, and we know that it's damaging to your health. So, like, we do try to avoid that. Right. Um, the game of hockey has changed over the years, and now kind of protect players. So it's definitely not as bad as it was in the past. Mm-hmm. So, um, but at the same time, I mean, it's still very physical guys are getting banged up all the time um i mean in the nhl you hear about people in the playoffs they don't even tell the trainers that they're injured until after like the series are over with because they don't want to miss any time so guys are playing with like terrible like broken ankles and like seriously yeah they do that broken ribs yeah that's pretty metal (laughs) that's pretty metal so yeah i mean you guys wear mouth guards yeah yeah i mean i assume you have to Mm -hmm. i've gotten a little bit used to that from boxing. I mean, the whole point of boxing is, well, I mean, you do get hit, but hit and don't get hit, right? Yeah. And, I mean, the the mouth guard saves you quite a bit. I've taken, you know, it's supposed to be body shots. Mm-hmm. Some kid just throws a punch wrong and uppercuts you as hard as he can. Just saves your teeth. Yeah. Pretty good for you. I mean. Yeah, boxing's pretty brutal. Like, that's yeah. physical. I mean, where I train there's mostly kids but you know um sparring with people my age around you know 20 to 25 around there it could be pretty tough yeah um definitely especially when you're with somebody at your skill level and you want to test each other's skills out it can then just you know just turn into punches and they're not even trying to dodge anymore it's just how <laughs> many times can you get hit and how many times can you keep hitting <laughs> um yeah for me with training i've only been there for about five months or so but it's i learned a lot and it's probably the only i guess i could say sport that i've really taken seriously i've never really played in high school or middle school i got into basketball a little bit in middle school but i never made the team i didn't have any sports in high school whatsoever like my school was small they didn't have any teams like the most i got was like kind of like a weekend team thing um for basketball Mm -hmm. we had like soccer for class so that wasn't really it you just kind of like uh it was co-ed so all the boys would just kind of like run past the girls and <laughs> yeah. they would try to take the ball, but it wasn't super intricate. Um, did you have any sports in your high school? Yeah. Uh, we had a, a good amount. I mean, I played hockey and baseball, um, but we had all sorts of, I mean, we had football, soccer, mm-hmm. lacrosse. I mean, lacrosse is huge in the Northeast. Oh, yeah. So, um, 
And a bunch of other random ones. I'm trying to think. Track and field, cross mm-hmm. country, things like that. Oh, yeah. Actually, I did. I did run too, but that wasn't for a sport either. <laughs> that was outside of school. <laughs> <laughs> what is it like uh, being a mentor for people? Yeah, I mean, it's it's cool. I certainly want to be a good mentor. Um, you know, I think they're so important. And I think I've come to the realization that I'm... You know, I'm doing what I can do, but that's only worth so much. And enabling people around you to, you know, allow growth in their own sense and, you know, help them achieve what they are going after is is more important almost than, like, your own individual, like, goals. Because, you know, individual goals are important, but... Um, I guess, you know, when you're trying to do something that has a ton of big impact, Mm -hmm. you need more people around. Like, nothing great is ever created or accomplished by just one person. Mm -hmm. Um, Doing things that are, like, world-changing or, like, life-changing, you know, typically require multiple people. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm good at what I do, I like to think. But it took me, you know, whatever, 10, 12 years to get here. If I can help someone like you or someone else Mm -hmm. get to where I'm at in half of that time or a quarter of that time, like, that's amazing for that person and for me. And, like, imagine Mm -hmm. what we all could do as a team. And then, and then, you know, pay it forward in a sense that, you know, in a couple of years you start training somebody Mm -hmm. and it took you. You know, if, if it took you four to six years to get there with my help, you know, with my help and your help, imagine what a third person can do mm-hmm. and how quickly they can get up to speed. And, you know, it that's that's how great things are going to get accomplished. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think you're doing an excellent job, especially being able to balance, you know, Loomis, um, the business, um you know, having interns and the ever-changing environment that we kind of, like, thrown ourselves into, whether it's, like, uh, gaining new projects, making relationships with people, and learning new technologies, like learning how to use AI at the same time and some of the risks that may appear shortly, mm-hmm. right? Oh, yeah. Um yeah, I mean, seeing myself as a mentor later, that's kind of a little bit strange for me. <laughs> but, I mean, it's not like I haven't done it in some way, like, with the kids that are in my boxing class. They definitely look up to me and um, showing them not to be scared of, like, a sense, like, having bravery towards it. Even if they they are scared, tell them to... Uh, that it's gonna it's gonna be all right, and you know I could see that with uh, the three the three engineers here at Loomis, <laughs> right? Um, seeing you guys uh, just work past these goals that I don't think I could see myself doing right now, but later on, I think it might be doable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know I've learned a lot here very very quickly, and you know starting with an idea with all of us just like trying to get on and making a podcast and just making a thing and now it's growing i think pretty fast you know there's a lot of things a lot of things to learn here a lot of things to check out so i'm um, excited for you know what's to come mm-hmm. and and you alluded to something too that i think is important to note that you don't always have to set out with this goal to be a mentor Sometimes and very often, I'll say, it just kind of happens, like, naturally. Mm -hmm. And it's not that you're going out, you know, you're not waking up in the morning and you're going, okay, I need to be the best mentor for my mentees and I need to show them these checklists of things. It just kind of happens. And, um, I mean, when you're a person who enjoys, like, sharing knowledge and I think 
I think a thing that I love is when I see others have that like eureka moment when like a concept clicks in their head, like something that they mm-hmm. didn't know before. And then you can kind of see once it like sinks in and they really understand it. I think that's such like an unbelievable feeling. Mm-hmm. Like I get a little bit of like a rush thinking about that person having that moment. So like if I can help induce that in others, then it makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. And so it just kind of occurs naturally that like, you know, I just like woke up one day and I'm like, oh, shoot, I guess I'm like a mentor to a couple of these people. Like, I'm not even (laughs) thinking about it like that. Like, I'm just trying to just trying to trade concepts and and show them what I know, because hell, like I've banged my head on a table trying to solve some software problem for like three or four days. Oh, shoot. (laughs) And then I see like, you know, someone else trying to solve it. You know, I don't want them to go through what I had to go through to get there. Like, I'm just going to explain it to them. Hey, here's how it works. I know, like, it's crazy. I don't know how or why it does that. But all I know is that this works, Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, and sometimes that's all it takes, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, yeah, seek out. And I think, well, I'll add one more thing before saying what I was about to say. Um, I think, yeah, it's important, like, one find good mentors in your life um but then also um being a good mentor can help you also improve just Mm, mm -hmm. you know whether it's like socially or um if you are teaching other people a certain topic it probably is going to help solidify your knowledge better and force you to question yourself like man okay you get to a point and someone might ask you a question about that topic that you're training them on, but they might ask you a question that you're like, oh, shoot, I never thought about that before. And then it forces you to kind of do a little research or or think more about it. Mm-hmm. And now you've learned that knowledge because they've asked it. So you've added more tools to your, you know, your toolbox. Right. And so it's like a win win. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so, yeah, like. For sure, those are two things, like find good mentors, but likewise, um, pay it forward and be a good mentor to others. And you don't have to like seek it out or think about it, you know, go out with this mission to be a mentor, but, um, you know, don't be afraid to take people under your wing or um, teach someone a topic when they're asking about it. Mm -hmm. Do you think it find it within you to like attempt to challenge those you're teaching? Yeah, I think that's certainly important. I think you, while you are teaching somebody else a topic that you might know more about, I think it's important that you don't just hand over all the answers right away. Mm-hmm. Um, like letting them go through the struggle a little bit is also valuable because now they're force to use their critical thinking and their problem solving skills to Mm -hmm. get to the answer. Right. Um, But if you see them struggling too much and it's wasting time and it's not a uh, productive struggle, I'll say that's when you can jump in and say, okay, look, Hey, pause here for a second. You know, we're going down the wrong path. Let's, let's rewind, come back. Okay. Now let's, let's start over and go down this path. Mm -hmm. I would say, We've only done a couple of uh, programming sessions together. Mm-hmm. I think for me personally, I think programming is probably one of the hardest things um, to pass on uh, just because it's a little bit less hands-on and more thinking and trying to get the logic down. It's like I know for me with SolidWorks, uh, Eduardo is just kind of giving me a task and basically telling me, you know, figure it out test yourself i learned a lot of stuff along the way and he's there to give it a second thought if i think something's are incorrect same thing with joe when we're going over uh electrical diagrams and we do the point to point at the end he'll let me do my thing um try to figure it out on my own if i have little questions he'll he'll direct me and he'll show me a little bit but you know it's good too that you guys have the time to teach me but also as well as be busy to mm-hmm. kind of let me do my own thing to figure it out on my own and 
Um, I'm sure we'll, I'll get to a point with that with you when more opportunities arrive for programming. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not the first time you guys sat me down in front of an PLC and an HMI and kind of mm-hmm. let me like pick at it. And sure, I think I've gotten a couple of things down with programming, but, um, you know, it's new. I don't, I'm not, still unfamiliar. I can get things kind of working. I understand like it's open, close, NPN, PNP, um, things like that. A lot, a lot of the little details, but it's still a bit foreign to me in terms of programming, you know, being going, going through a school and learning C++, learning Arduino's code, which is a version of C. I'm um, going through a Python class, stuff mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I guess I'll, I'll have one last sort of comment on the mentoring thing. And um, I'll say that that is I'll s- probably like the biggest struggle with trying to be a mentor is that balance of like yeah trying to get things done fast but then also you want to be able to work with the people around you and kind of show them what you're doing and take your time with it Mm -hmm. um i don't know where i you know i don't have anything necessarily beyond that statement but that's like a a thing i've noticed that is a difficult part about mentoring is like Mm -hmm. yeah like you want to especially when it comes to like work stuff like you're saying programming Mm -hmm. um and programming can almost be like art in the sense of everyone can have their own way of doing it there are you know there's function there's standardized function blocks like if then statements and case statements and whatnot Mm -hmm. but the way that you put all those pieces of the puzzle together to make an end and product or whatever end finalized piece of code um, everyone can do it differently. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, it's an interesting conundrum where you want to take your time and teach someone how to do these things. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you know, you gotta, you gotta move fast and keep everything going. Right. And I like that, that you mentioned that programming is like an art. Yeah. I mean, everybody can, develop their own style after you learn the basics right Mm -hmm. and um i've heard a lot of things that uh, eduardo and joe had uh mentioned that the way that you're able to solve some things that uh they were incredibly and you know surprised and impressed (laughs) maybe some things with uh one of our more recent projects with moving those large servo motors ah yeah you know, I mean, do uh, you think you can share something about the process of programming um, that incredibly large machine, like, kind of on your own? Uh, y- yeah, I mean, pr- yeah. Programming is, it is something that's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> and um, it's something that you need to be extremely detail-oriented in. Mm -hmm. because there's not one right answer but there's a million wrong answers and if you don't you know with what we do we're moving actual machinery like that's you know we're doing industrial automation it's not just like i don't know like it's not like a web development right it's it's we're moving physical things and um you know, we're good at what we do and we put ourselves in situations that are potentially dangerous and either you're moving very large things very fast in a space where people will be actively walking and moving and maybe paying attention, maybe not. Mm -hmm. Um, We could be dealing with explosive gases and tanks and pressures and having to manipulate that and you know doing things based on sensor readings Mm -hmm. um and so if you don't if you don't plan the sensor readings correctly and you're not making all the things happen that need to happen based on certain things like you yeah you could be you could basically be letting a bomb build up of explosive gas Mm -hmm. so you know i think that's where my 
mindset of questioning things all the time helps the overthinking i mean i think it's kind of like what like an engineering trait right yeah being able to to think about all the variables all the possibilities of the situations that you put yourself in to consider um when designing this right yeah the programming process of it yeah i mean with with what we do um safety always needs to be considered Mm -hmm. so what i'll the way i'll typically think about solving a problem i mean i'll you know i'll know going into it what the overall functioning functionality should be Mm -hmm. um like talking about um the project where we're moving a a bunch of big big servo motors big things like basically moving 20,000 pounds around a gantry where people will be moving in that space. Mm -hmm. Um, So first off, I'm thinking about how the movement will work. Um, And so I know it could hit a wall in a few different directions. So I know I can't exceed those positions. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know people will be moving around the wall, so I need to figure out a way for the wall to detect these people. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we figured that out. And then um, and then you need to think of, like, what could possibly go wrong and, and, like, everything. And even stuff that's maybe not related to your system. Like, for that one, you know, we, we did the motors and the electrical system and the software, but we didn't have very much control over the mechanical design and we executed 0% of the mechanical design. So Mm -hmm. I'm now working with the team that did the mechanical side and talking with them about like, Hey, how, how are you doing this? How are you doing that? Well, you know, what if this happens? What if the motor runs away? What if the coupling from the motor breaks like in the wall is going to just keep going mm-hmm. um, or the, the load, I should say. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe we should add that out or I can say that again. Put the correct word yeah. over. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so I guess, so I'm working with the team that did the mechanical side to talk about these different scenarios of what will happen if like if a coupler breaks and the load runs away, there's nothing my software can do at that point to to do that Mm -hmm. um so now maybe we need to think of like a backup system and things like that or Mm -hmm. i could write the code in a way that that dramatically limits the possibility for that happening Mm -hmm. so maybe i don't you know maybe i don't accelerate the load super fast maybe it takes some time to ramp up to speed and it takes some time to ramp down Mm -hmm. so um it's really it it's it's tough to say like, Hey, here's how you go about writing a piece of software. Cause it's, it's different in every scenario. You need to think about the overall functions that need to occur. So basically, you know, the, um, like the must haves on the project, like I must do this, must do that. But you also need to now think about every single way that this could go wrong. Mm -hmm. And this isn't, I'll say this isn't a scenario where how we're talking earlier about making decisions, are we going to go Italian or Chinese tonight? Well, let's just pick one and right. it'll be fine. Mm-hmm. This is one where these scenarios where we need to think about every single detail. And if we overlook one or even if we think about it, but we don't execute it in the code properly, if we don't implement the code properly and something goes wrong, it could be very dangerous. Mm-hmm. So, so having a, yeah, I mean, you can't be overconfident when you're programming. You need to you need to swallow your own ego and question yourself constantly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a very beautifully put <laughs> process of how you know I think a an engineer thinks and a programmer thinks put together mm-hmm. uh, for the system, and um, I think that leads us off on a on a good note for this podcast i think uh all right it was good it was a nice nice long one yeah um you know i think we definitely have more than enough 
uh, topics for another one, just okay. uh, person yeah. to person. Definitely. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, we didn't even. Like, we've been here for longer than an hour for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, we gotta save some stuff for next time, like uh, like meditation. Uh, we can get into. The, but uh, hey, we we got. We'll have to do another one. We'll go more on topic on the mind and stuff. But I think, you know, leaving it on the programming bit is really good. Um, a really good juicy topic. All right. That yeah. I I should have asked you. I think at the beginning. Yeah, we could have. Man, I could talk about programming for a long time. That'll we could implement that in the next one too. Oh yeah. So, thanks, Brett. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. It was fun talking with you. Yeah. And uh, we'll, we'll see you guys uh, on the next episode. All right. See you guys. All right.